Hello, um, welcome to this uh, session on the oh, beginnings of the Nazi party. Um, put into some context what we've done recently and what we'll be doing in the next couple of sessions. Okay, so unlike the start of the last couple, we'll not do a quiz this time. I just think it's important to set up some chronology issues here because we're going to go back a little bit um, from where we've been studying recently. Okay, so the first thing to think about is that we already we've already discussed the political chaos. Uh, of the Weimar Republic, Versailles, we've looked at 1923 in crisis, so the invasion of the Ruhr and hyperinflation. Um, we mentioned that Stresemann has now taken over from Ebert following the hyperinflation um, in mid to late 1923. Um, however, as all that was going on, this Nazi party, um, the NSDAP, they were busy um, just developing really, forming, starting in 1919, um, while all this was going on, the Nazi party were there, they were busy in the pubs, um, speakers were lecturing and moaning and whinging about the state of Germany, um, exactly as we know from our recent um, sessions, so just to keep in mind that the Nazi party were there and they were beginning and growing, um, so this session we'll look at the Nazi party from its roots. Um, just to set up exactly where we need to be going forward, okay? Uh, especially when we look at the Munich Putsch, which is Hitler's attempt to take over Germany or Munich, and then he plans to go up to Berlin and take over the government in Berlin. This happens at the end of 1923. Bear in mind that year was a year of crisis. Um, so Hitler and the Nazi party, they felt that they were in a position to do it. They also felt that the country would support them um, based on the chaos and hell of hyperinflation and everything else. Uh, so we'll look at the Munich Putsch in the next session. Um, this session is all about setting up the Nazi party. Some of it you already know, some of it is a little bit myth by now, um, but hopefully by the end of this you've got an idea of some key characters um, and where this party stands and where they believe uh, what they believe in. Okay, so let's get started on the rise of the Nazi party. So we'll look at this in the early bit, so 1920 to 22 really, um, but it, as I say chrono chronologically it um, spawns a little bit before and a little bit after as well. So the policies of this party are something we need to keep in mind. Obviously, we've all got this idea that the Nazi party, they hated Jews. Um, they wanted to get rid of all foreigners and all things like this. Some of that is uh, is accurate. Some of that is, is a little bit uh, out of context. So this party is a party like every other party uh, in the political spectrum in Germany. So we know, don't we, that there are 20 plus parties in Germany, all in this proportional representation um, where they get votes so for every 60,000 votes they get a seat in parliament um, so there's lots of parties with lots of different views in Germany so let's see um, what this thing starts off as just a little bit before before we meet the party let's have a little look at Hitler okay so these photographs are quite interesting there's baby Hitler at the top um, and then Hitler in in school and then Hitler as a soldier in World War One um, they're just interesting to look at and see the development of this of this man he's obviously gone down in history as one of the most evil men ever. Um, so it's just quite useful and interesting to see the context of his development. Okay, so we'll just go through some information. At the end of all this, your job will be to just to su summarise Hitler's early story to about 75 words max. Okay, so firstly, he's Austrian. He's not even German. Uh, I think some of you will know that. Um, he fights for Germany in the war, uh, and that's to do with the Anschluss or the union between Austria, Hungary and Germany. Remember after the Treaty of Versailles? They weren't allowed to have this Anschluss or this union with Austria-Hungary anymore. Uh, he does get on pretty badly with his father, um, and he was quite fond of his mother. So he's got he's got some redeeming features. He was quite close to his mum, but it definitely was not to his father. He, he's probably abused, actually, um, by his dad. Um, at 16, he leaves school, and he goes off to Vienna in Austria to pursue his ambition of being a painter. This is one of the famous... Uh, things people know about Hitler is he was a painter uh, and he wants to be a painter um, and effectively what happens is he goes to be a student um, and he's rejected. Uh, a lot of people say that the person who rejected them was a Jew and that formed part of Hitler's hatred of the Jews. Um, I don't know, possibly a lot of his different experiences are what contribute to uh, a person's beliefs and views. So he becomes a bit of a down and out really um, in, in the streets of Vienna. It's not going well at all between 1909 and 1914. Um, so at this point, um, this idea of the Jews, or the hatred of the foreigners, uh, while he's on the streets, 
Um, he sees that it doesn't seem fair that these foreigners are doing well economically. They've got businesses, a lot of Jews owned a lot of shops and things. So while Hitler's struggling and he looks at these people, he thinks this is not right and this is not fair. All right. So he then joins up World War One. It couldn't have come at a better time, really, because he's got nothing. His life is at rock bottom. Uh, this war comes along and it gives him the opportunity to contribute or to feel like he's doing something positive and giving something back. So he joins up in the war uh, and eventually he wins uh, an Iron Cross, which is Germany's highest uh, military honour. So he gets his Iron Cross for bravery and various other bits and bobs um, and World War One ends. And that's sort of where we started our, our course here, isn't it? Is uh, Germany, during the end of World War One, how it was struggling, and then at the end, um, lots of people who thought they were winning because of the Kaiser's propaganda. Um, and Hitler was in those trenches. He'd been gassed at the end. And then he finds out that he's, he's, they've lost the war. So that, that forms a real basis as to why Hitler is so angry with this government. Remember the November criminals because they signed the armistice in November the 11th. All right. Uh, he finds it hard to accept the Treaty of Versailles. I think everyone can agree the Treaty of Versailles was, was really harsh. But Hitler, amongst many other Germans, felt betrayed, okay, particularly by the Jews and the capitalists because they felt that they were profiting from the Treaty of Versailles uh, from, uh, and losing profit, sorry, because of the war. So he's really angry and bitter towards the, the, the Weimar Republic. Uh, he despised this democracy, this idea of this new Weimar Republic, this country people vote. He is right-wing, Hitler, so he's got this idea of national pride, um, order, traditional structure, um, crime control, all of those things we talked about in the previous sessions. He wants to go back to the glory days of the Kaiser and empire and things like that. And, and as we know, as the end of the story goes, as Hitler does in fact build a huge empire during World War II as he takes over Europe in a matter of weeks, especially Western Europe. Um, so these are the views of Hitler. And it goes without saying that as he becomes the leader of this Nazi party, that they'll be some of the policies that the party come to adopt his own personal views. OK, he stays in the army after the war and he's given a job as an intelligence officer. So he goes, he's he sent to spy on this NSDAP or the DAP at the time and um, the German Workers Party. He sent a spy on them, so they're in pubs and they're spouting off and they're saying this is terrible and this is bad and this is awful and Ebert this and Versailles this, all these things. So Hitler is actually sent to work for the government and while he's in there, in the pub, listening to the German Workers' Party, the DAP, um, he, he actually likes what they say. So he, he joins, he signs up. Okay, so we'll move on after you've summarised this. Just have a little re read through it again, pause the screen and just try and summarise that into a little... Um, graphic or paragraph, just summarising Hitler's early story and then we'll move on. Okay, so this is one of the best photographs I think I've ever seen really. Uh, it shows obviously thousands of people in this crowd listening to a speech. Um, people are obviously shouting and cheering and angry. But interestingly, you probably worked out already in this little circle in the very middle of it, is that this is Hitler in, in this and you can see at the picture is zoomed into Hitler, how he's interested, he's listening. He seems to be excited about whatever the speaker is saying. He is in this picture. Maybe this gives him a little bit of an idea or inspiration to what goes on to come um, Hitler as a speaker himself. Okay, just an interesting photograph, really, to see that even at the very beginning, Hitler is involved and gets himself interested in, in politics. So the DAP... The German Workers' Party, let's have a little look at the ideology of this party. So its leader is Anton Drexler. He's the, he's the boss of the DAP. This is this party member that is in pubs starting off, very small numbers. So the leaders of the DAP, as we said, is Anton Drexler and Ernst Rom. Uh, we're going to get to know Ernst Rom very, very well as this course goes on. He does meet a bit of a grisly end, but before that, he he's very important in the rise of the Nazi party. Um, it's founded in February 1919, so that's a month after the Spartacus uprising. It's a party of protest. Of course it's protest. We've seen already, haven't we, the amount of chaos that is uh, going on in Germany. It makes should be no surprise to you really that there's lots of parties springing up or lots of people with political views in the aftermath of World War I. So February 1919, very early on, this party, the DAP, the German Workers' Party, is set up. It's concerned about the breakdown of law and order. Well, I think everyone would be. If you were walking around the streets of Germany in those early years after the war, you might be concerned as well. 
all right? Uh, and this bit in red is really important. That's why it's in red. It, they hate the Weimar politicians. They really are angry about Dolchtos, the November criminals. Um, they hate democracy, the idea of democracy. Uh, and they hate the Weimar constitution, you know, given um, everyone votes and given women votes and all these things. The DAP are quite a traditional party. And as we've said, why Hitler is sent to spy on them is because they're attacking the government. Um, but we know, don't we, that Hitler... He believes the same. He feels let down uh, by the government, by the November criminals as well. So when he goes and listens to Anton Drexler and Ernst Rom delivering these speeches in the pubs, it, it clicks, it connects to him, and that's why he joins up. Okay? Uh, they are very hostile to the wealth and privilege of the upper classes. Now, there's a little bit of irony there, isn't there? Because that sounds very communist. Um, and we'll see as this session goes on that this DAP and then the NSDAP, the Nazi party, they generally do try to appeal to everybody uh, to try and get votes uh, and supporters but they really do hate the idea of wealth and privilege of the upper classes so that's quite a, a working class um, policy to have left wing mixed with a little bit of right wing maybe um, they are very anti-semitic anti-semitism remember is that attacking of jews or critical of jews anything negative about jews or jewish people uh, is is termed anti-semitic so they blame the jews for the economy because the jews control all the businesses and banks and shops in the views of the members of the DAP. All right, they wanted to limit the annual profits of firms to 10,000 marks. Again, that's quite a communist idea, isn't it? This idea of not having the ability to make loads of profits while people are poor and struggling to feed their families. They want to limit the profit of companies to just 10,000 marks a year, then put the rest of that money, I guess, back into the economy and into the workers' pockets. Okay, they, they want skilled workers to be considered middle class. So skilled workers being um, builders, tradespeople, um, jobs like that, that traditionally have been classed as working class jobs. The DAP want them to be uh, considered middle class. So a, a good, strong uh, middle class profession. They also want a classless socialist organisation led only by Germans. So there's elements of, of the ideology of this DAP that we can relate to and we can think, yeah, that's nice, that works. Um, everyone together, no one struggling, suffering. But then it says things like led only by Germans and that sort of takes us down the, the racist route and the anti-foreigner kind of feelings that we know are going to come uh, as this party develops. Um, and then Hitler joins in the 19th of September 1919 and he is the seventh member of the DAP. But on his membership card, it says he's the 555th member. So just have a little think before we, we talk about this. Pause the screen, maybe have a think, maybe write some ideas of why you think they made Hitler uh, on his membership card. They put 555th member instead of the 7th member. So that means the 6th before him. This is a huge party. Um, and that's a bit of a clue. Okay, so the reason why is simple. This is Hitler's membership card right here, um, just popped up on the bottom of the screen. They put the 555th member simply to make it look like it was a bigger party than it was, that it was a bit of a proper party, really. So a party having 555 members is certainly a lot more impressive than a party that has seven members. Um, so that's why they did it. So already, even at the start of the NSDAP or the, the DAP, um, there is an element of propaganda being used to try and make people think differently about the party, okay? So that's just a little bit of a breakdown of the DAP, so the party itself, the German Workers' Party, led by Anton Drexler uh, and some of their political views, okay? Now, The Rise of Evil is on uh, the website, stchistory.com. It's in the video section and the Germany section. Um, it's on YouTube as well, and if you've got the DVD, even better. Uh, it's an amazing um, film showing the start of the Nazi party from the trenches, um, through to Hitler becoming Chancellor. So 18 minutes to 27-ish, roughly, will give you um, the visual of the last couple of uh, pages of this session. Just the start of the party and, and in the pubs and Anton Drexler being introduced to Hitler and things like that. So 18 minutes to about 27 if you've got The Rise of Evil um, or if you want to go to the video section of stchistory.com and just watch it there. Okay. So Hitler then, a bit more about him. So he's joined this party, um, he's listening to what they're saying and he he starts being given a platform, okay? Uh, people like Hitler, the, what he speaks, he's got a bit more charisma than perhaps Anton Drexler. He's able to um, evoke passion and energy 
when he gets his speeches and he becomes very famous. It spreads a little bit around the pubs of Munich uh, and Bavaria. Oh, this guy, Hitler, you want to come and hear Hitler? He's really good. He's, he speaks. He speaks for us all. He says what we're all thinking. Uh, and before we know it, it the, the numbers visiting the pubs and listening grow. And, and that is partly all down to Hitler's um, way, Hitler's speaking ability and skills. And we'll look a lot more about that as we go through this course. All right, so he becomes the German Workers' Party head of propaganda in 1920, in January. He basically is, is Drexler's number two. All right, so he's risen to the, through the ranks of the party very quickly, considering he's only been in it for a very short time. And that maybe gives you some idea about Hitler and his abilities. Okay, and then in July 1921, so about 18 months later, he becomes the leader. So he's managed to remove Anton Drexler as the leader uh, so we'll see all these things as we develop. This is Hitler's view of this DAP. This is the new DAP in July 1921 with Hitler as its leader. These are the priorities. So what are these things describing? Okay, so yeah, it's describing the um, Nazi symbol, the swastika. A symbol it really is, Hitler says. In red, we see the social idea of the movement and in white, the nationalist idea. In the swastika, the mission of the struggle for the victory of Aryan man. So again, similarly to what we've talked about earlier in this session, there seems to be some irony or contradictions to a right-wing party talking about socialism um, and the mission of the struggle for victory and of the people and of the workers, but then that element of only for Aryans. Um, so we, we can see this already at the start of this session, and this will definitely develop. But keep in mind, as we go through these sessions, this Nazi party are, are pretty full of, full of contradictions and uh, the whole principle of the Nazi party is to try and appeal to as many people as possible, be that from the left or the right. Okay, But, but fundamentally and principally, they're all about a strong Germany Okay, with strong Germans. So that's the swastika. Now, this DAP's 25-point programme, we might call this today, if you um, are aware of, each party has... Uh, a document or a manifesto, it's called, with their views and their beliefs. Uh, especially these manifestos generally come out when there's an election or a general election. So the 25-point program is on the website next to this video link in the Germany section of stchistory.com. So just go and open that up or, or print it or just have it on the screen as you read through the following. So we might have to pause the screen a little bit and um, open up that. Um, file as well as you do this next task. They maybe take five to ten minutes, maybe a little bit longer. Um, just pause the screen and play when and if you need. So the things I'd like you to do on this uh, document or the 25 point program is to get five highlighters and I want you to highlight anything in the 25 point program that talks about revising the Treaty of Versailles or attacking the Treaty of Versailles. Um, anything that's aimed at restricting civil liberties. So anything that it talks about, that talks about controlling people's freedom, personal freedom, going places, doing things, saying things. Well, highlight that in that colour or identify that in some way. Anything that's anti-capitalist. So anything that you think in the 25-point programme um, that goes against big business and industry or criticises profits. Uh, highlight anything that is nationalist, anything about making Germany strong and great again, and anything that's anti-Semitic uh, or anti-Jewish. So it's quite a difficult task. There's quite a lot to, to um, read and to try and work out and, and identify, but it'll be a useful exercise just to give you this idea that we've said that the Nazi party, or the DAP, sorry, uh, before they become the Nazi party, they're, they're appealing to as many people as possible. So just from these five categories, you can see there is an appeal to a broad range of people. There's definitely uh, stuff in there about Versailles. There's things in there about people's freedom and liberty. There's things in there about um, poor people feeling suffering because of the rich. There's things in there about being proud to be German and this nationalist view. Uh, and there's things in there anti-Semitic about the Jews. So the, the, the Nazis uh, will develop this programme of the DAP, this 25-point programme, but it's just deliberately vague to appeal to everybody. Okay, so let's do that task and then we'll move on. Hopefully you found that quite useful to see that actually um, there was lots of things in there probably that you, you agree with uh, politically, um, lots of things you disagree with as well. And that is the point, remember, that it is designed deliberately to be vague and appeal to as many people as possible and get as many supporters as possible. So uh, a little quote then from Anton Drexler. He says, goodness, he's got a big gob. 
we could use him. And, that, and he said that. Um, so what, what's your sort of inference from that quote? Okay, so yeah, hopefully you've got some ideas that this guy is a good speaker. He's, he's loud. He says things. He gets a crowd going. Um, we could use him, the DAP, to get support. That's clear to me, I think, and hopefully you too, that he sees Hitler as a, an opportunity to raise the profile of the Nazi party or the DAP. Okay, so I keep saying Nazi party rather than DAP, and this is why, because from now on, from April, it, it became known as the Nazi party. So the German Workers' Party, as it originally stood, was the uh, DAP. They've added the N and the S, so National Socialist German Workers' Party, uh, or National Socialist Deutsche Arbeit Party, um, the NSDAP, and that was just shortened to the Nazi Party. So from now on, when we say the Nazi Party, it's just that original German Workers' Party with National Socialism added to the front. Again, nationalism, right-wing, socialism, left-wing, an appeal to everybody. So the definitions of the two are on the screen. Um, a patriotic feeling, often to excess sometimes. This is why sometimes people who are nationalist or uh, are quite... Uh, nationalists are accused of being racist and not always is the case but it is often to an excess a patriotic feeling and readiness to support and defend a country um a lot of we see a lot of americans don't we are quite nationalistic with their flags and things like that uh, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that but sometimes it can go to extreme and then socialism social you know society is about the nation's land its transport its resources its industries the idea of socialism is that the people own all of that so no one is making profit off the workers that's what socialism means so we've now got our national socialist german workers party and having done the 25 point program i think like i say there'll be things in there that you agree with totally and there'll be things in there that hopefully horrify you um and and upset you at the idea that these kind of things can be thought by politicians so here we are we've set up the nsdap hopefully you've got a bit of an idea about what Anton Drexler thinks, who Hitler is, what Hitler thinks. So let's just go through a little bit more about Hitler's personal appeal. So this painting, again, you can pause the screen and make some notes on your Cornell notes or in your book or on paper, however you do in your notes from this session, and just make some observations about what you can see in this painting. Remember, it's a painting, so it's been designed by somebody to give a certain interpretation, but there are some obvious things that might jump out at you. So pause the screen and then have a go and then we'll discuss. Okay, so here we can see in this painting, Hitler is, is higher up. He, he's standing on a chair, uh, he's given a forceful speech, his hands are going, he's quite animated, um, and we can see lots and lots of people listening intently to what he's saying, mostly men, but there are some ladies in this painting as well. So it's exhibited by Hitler at the Great German Art Exhibition in 1937. That means Hitler likes this painting. He has allowed it to be exhibited in 1937. Uh, so this is two years before World War II. This is in the height of the Nazis' power in Germany after they get elected in 1933. Um, so obviously he feels quite happy that the message that this, this image gives of the Nazi party and him. And it's called, In the Beginning There Was the Word. And this is really interesting because this is playing on the idea of religion. And in the Bible, which is the word of God and things like that. So really quite controversial. But clearly from this painting, uh, Hitler sees himself um, as quite well a religious figure almost. In the beginning, there was the word. Now, in the beginning, 1921 of this German Workers' Party, Hitler started with the word, didn't he? He's given some speeches in some pubs, uh, attacking Versailles, attacking Eber, attacking the Weimar Republic talking about the glory days of empire and all these things that people appeal were appealing to. Um, so that, that's what this painting represents, and that's why Hitler's chosen to exhibit it in 1937 or to allow it to be exhibited. So his own personal appeal, we can see this ability to hold an audience, to be animated, uh, charismatic, um, and we'll see as this course goes on, he's very good at delivering speeches. Um, so he's an amazing public speaker. Um, he begins slow. It's really interesting. And there's lots of videos on, on our YouTube channel and in the video section, Germany, um, of speeches that Hitler's delivered. You can see that he begins really slowly, purposefully waiting for the crowd to quieten down uh, until it's silent. And then he starts speaking slow. And then he gets a little bit faster and he gets a little bit louder. 
And in the end, he ends up in this frenzied rant, um, spitting everywhere and shouting, arms flying, Versailles, they've destroyed us, they've attacked us, they've humiliated us, they've made us look weak. And the whole crowd um, end up being in a frenzied rant as well. And this is how he does it. And this is how he manages to get people screaming with goosebumps and energy and excitement. And remember, he's only saying what the people want to hear, what they feel. Those people who've been through hyperinflation, the people who've been through the war, he's telling them what they want to hear and he does it in a really powerful way. All right, he's very persuasive. He's able to persuade people to think along his lines. Uh, it helps, I suppose, doesn't it, when you're quite vague in what you're saying because you can interpret what he says however you want, really. Um, and sometimes he might just touch on something that you sort of believe in uh, and you go with that and you ignore the rest. All right. Uh, his gestures, the way he throws his arms around and his hands up, um, it just get, adds to the to the words that he's using and to the frenzy of, of the crowd. Uh, we talk about that painting on the right. Um, you can see that this is probably a very typical scene with Hitler delivering speeches. It doesn't look hugely attended in 1921, but it certainly looks like it's got women and men in there. Um, and as time goes on, he starts delivering these speeches at, at rallies. So rallies, a huge gathering. Um, one of the biggest would probably be the Nuremberg rallies, where we're you know we're over a couple of hundred thousand people listening to one of these speeches. All right. So at 31 of the 46 DAP gatherings at the start uh, of the German Workers Party, he was the star speaker. He was the one who was invited to speak. And as we sort of said a little bit earlier on in the session. As people heard about him and what he was saying, well, they they joined, they they came to listen. He, he became pretty famous down in the south of Germany in Munich, not particularly nationally yet. He's not really that well known around the country yet uh, until 1923 when he attempts to take over the Bavarian government in Munich. But he's starting to be famous within the circles that he's hanging around with uh, and certainly those people who support the DAP's views or, or the right-wing members of Germany, okay? So he's getting there. He's becoming pretty famous. Uh, and due to him, the popularity of the Nazi party grows uh, and membership of the party grows from that seven in 1919 um, to 3,000 by the end of 1920. So there's some real factual evidence there that Hitler is having an impact on the Nazi party. People are joining it. People are listening and liking what he says. Okay, so hopefully you get a bit of an idea from this painting and just these thoughts of him himself and who he is and how he's grown in popularity. All right, so let's have a go at our interpretation questions. These things, they're not easy, um, but the more we practice them, the better we'll be and the easier they'll get. So remember, we've got our frame when we look at what an interpretation is. Um, they will generally follow, you will write, the view of interpretation one is... Um, you've read it and you've worked out the view. Um, I can tell this because it says, so you'll quote from it. And then in this case, I want you to agree with this interpretation because of something you know or something we've talked about in this session. So before we do, let's talk through the interpretation and we'll pause the screen and you can have a go at writing what the view of this interpretation is. So this will be half of question 3B in the section um, B of the Nazi paper, the Germany paper, remember it's the interpretations paper, so three A, B, C, D, they're all about these two interpretations. So this would be half of a four marker, we do a view of interpretation two um, as well. So we'll just practice with interpretation one for now, and it says, the 25 point program contained policies which may be described as either nationalist or socialist or both. The nationalist policies emphasize race, expansion, the army, power and relations with other countries. The socialist policies were to do with state control uh, over the living conditions of the people and the economy. So this interpretation by Stephen Lee, writing this in 1996, and remember, for an interpretation, it doesn't really bother us when it's being written. It's more about what Stephen Lee is saying or what he believes, what is his view. Okay, so remember the 25-point program, you've looked at it, it is this deliberately vague uh, manifesto or policy to try and appeal to everyone about the creation of strong government, uniting all Germans for the greater Germany, getting rid of the Treaty of Versailles, sorting out pensions, industry, everyone should work, no one with profits, um, all, all of that that we've looked at. So now, having said all that, let's see if we can work out what the view of interpretation one is. So pause the screen 
and answer these questions uh, or fill in the, the gaps for this. So we need to spend maybe about two or three minutes on this bit because then we'd need two or three minutes for the second interpretation. Remember, it's only worth four marks, so we don't want to spend too long on it. But the skill itself is probably more important than the four marks. So pause, have a go, and then we'll come back and see. I'll give you some ideas of what I think we could maybe maybe put. Okay, so let's have a little look at some of the things that I, I think about this, um, and we'll see. It's not necessarily perfect, but maybe give us a little bit of an idea about some of the things to pick out. So the view of interpretation one is that the NSDAP's 25-point program was designed to appeal to as many people in Germany as possible. It had something for everyone, depending on what they cared about. Okay, and to quote, to back that up or to prove it, uh, I've picked out that the program, quote, contained policies which may be described as either nationalist or socialist. Some emphasise race issues, uh, the army, relations with other countries, socialist policies, living conditions. Um, uh, the things that we know, we've talked already about how the, lots of people have different things that were important to them. So I've picked out some quotes from the interpretation that hopefully backs up. There's some left-wing appeal, some right-wing appeal, and some moderate in the middle appeal. Now, Asking you to agree now is not part of the early questions of section B, but in the big 20 marker, we do have to agree with the interpretation, so it's good to practice that as well. So hopefully uh, you've picked out some old knowledge that we've talked about in this session that can help you agree with this interpretation. So I've picked out something like, uh, I know that following World War I, Germany was in chaos politically and economically. Every German was angry or upset with the aftermath, whether they were left-wing or right-wing. Some were angry with Versailles, some wanted the Kaiser back, amongst other grievances. Because the NSDAP were relatively new, it would make sense that they would try to attract members, new members or supporters, and I know that they made their policies or ideas deliberately vague to appeal to as many Germans as possible, agreeing with this interpretation. So hopefully, just from my examples that we put on there, they're not perfect at all, um, and with a bit more time we could probably write a little bit more specific um, and detailed answers. But I just want you to just be thinking about how we how we do this question, how we break down the view of the interpretation. So we, we work out what they're trying to say, Stephen Lee in this case. We give some evidence from it that proves that. And then at the 20 marker, we need some own knowledge to agree with the interpretation. Something that we know supports what Stephen Lee is saying. And then the second half of that 20 marker is the, is the alternative, the other view. Um, so something else we know that maybe disagrees with it and supports somebody else's interpretations. Uh, remembering that interpretations are all about what one person believes about an event. Okay, so that, hopefully that was useful, just getting a little practice of that. We'll do a couple more in this session later on, but just to give us a bit of an idea about how these things work. So then we go back to our source question. Now the source questions are in the trenches paper and we have a source question in the Germany paper. Uh, how useful are these sources um, for an investigation or an inquiry into whatever it may be? But I don't want to do that now. I just want to get us a little bit back in, in the habit of practicing working out um, or analysing a source. So pause the screen and then knop the source. So work out what its nature, its origin and its purpose is. Um, you can scribble that down in, in your book or um, on your corner notes, whatever you're doing it, just work out what the knop of this source is. It's usually, remember, always found in the provenance, that's the smaller writing at the top of any source, gives us this information. Uh, what does this quotation tell you about Hitler's place within the DAP? And then number three, how far can we trust that this view of Hitler was representative or typical of all Germans, if, if you think it was? So pause the screen and try and answer those three things and then we'll have a little talk about it. Okay, so the nature of this source is it's a quotation. So some of these said this. The origin is in 1926, and it was said at a Nazi party meeting. Um, purpose, probably it's a uh, something supporting the, the views of the Nazi party, because it says, doesn't it, in the provenance, that it's a quotation from a supporter at a Nazi party meeting. So you got to think to yourself, he's gone there because he supports the Nazi party and he likes what they say, so he's probably not going to be too critical. So then what does it tell us about Hitler's place within the party? He says, a wave of jubilation, cheers, rising from afar, moving into the lobby, announced the arrival of the Führer. Führer means leader. And then the auditorium went wild. When the speech came to an end, there were tears in my eyes. Others, men, women and youngsters were deeply affected as I. 
So what kind of idea have we got about Hitler's place in the DAP? I think it's clear to see, isn't it, that he is very well regarded. He, he is the, the star of the show. These people have come to this meeting to hear him. Uh, he's got goosebumps, he's shivering, he's crying. Just just the sheer sight of Hitler in front of them and, and then what he's saying. So I think it tells us Hitler's place within the DAP is vital, it's critical. Without Hitler um, in the DAP or the Nazi party, I'm not sure they will have been quite so popular or appeal to quite as many people as they did. Um, remembering that he's just saying to these people what they want to hear um, in, in a rant. Okay, so it's quite a, a powerful source, really. It's a small source, but it certainly gives us a vivid impression that at this meeting, people were awestruck, starstruck by Hitler and, and overcome with emotion. And yet, there are probably people in Germany who heard of Hitler and go, oh, yeah, that's that idiot who goes on about stuff. It's interesting, isn't it? But it's the same in, in every country, really. Uh, some people love the leaders, some people don't. Some people are left wing, some people are right wing. Some people support Manchester United, some people don't. It's just how, how life in society is, but this source gives us a real taste. For those people who support the Nazi party, they really support the Nazi party. Um, very much so like, like President Trump in America. The people who love Trump, well, they really, really love Trump, don't they? Okay. All right, so number three, how far can we trust this view was representative? Um, we can't really, can we? This is one supporter uh, at a Nazi party, but probably it would be very representative of Nazi supporters. This is probably something that would be replicated in pubs and halls all over Germany as the Nazi party uh, grow. Now, we're in 1926, remember, right now, which is during Stresemann's good time. So the Nazi party are not ever so popular. And when we do that in the next couple of sessions, you'll see. But there are people who do love them. So the question asks how typical of all Germans, then, then probably not. All right. A lot of people in 1926 were good times were rolling again. People were happy. People were free to express themselves. Um, so this idea of this crazy Nazi party, we're talking about Versailles and foreigners and Jews, didn't really affect their, their lives at all. But it does tell us that those people who do support the, Nazis part, the Nazi party definitely loved the Nazi party. So quite a lot we've squeezed out of just a little source there. But just to give us an idea, these sources, remember, they take us back to time, back to the time that we're looking at which is really, really useful. All right, so on a blank bit of paper in your book or on your corner notes, just turn the back up, whatever you do it, don't mind, uh, just put in the middle of your page, party organisation. Now, we talked, didn't we, that one of Hitler's main um, policies when he took over the Nazi party was, was about the organisation of it. Uh, he's going to organise it several times before we get to 1933, but we'll just uh, plot some ideas around the party organisation, just generally at this point, so we get an idea about how he how he views the party and its structure. So the first thing he does is he opens up a permanent office in Munich. Now a permanent office means, well it makes the party look a bit more professional, doesn't it? A bit more slick, a bit more of an operation that they have a headquarters. And this is important because they were seen by many as a bunch of ranting men in a pub just moaning about the state of, of society. So now that they have a permanent office in Munich, it makes them a bit more professional, a bit more official. All right. He's renamed uh, the party the NSDAP, so he's added the National Socialist bit, remember, to specifically appeal to as many people as he can. National, appeal to the right. Socialist, appeal to the left. So that was an important part of his organisation of his party. Um, trying to appeal to as many people as possible, we've said that lots, the nationalists, the socialists, the workers, everybody. Okay. His meetings are better organised and they're advertised. So in the newspapers, um, billboards, um, posters up everywhere, on, on the radios, people will hear that at such and such a time that the NSDAP will be delivering a speech on Versailles. Now, if you remember back to a couple of sessions ago when we looked at the poster advertising the rally, um, much, much later on, still talking about the Treaty of Versailles, well, that was one of, of Hitler's ideas um, to try and make the party a little bit more, as I say, slick and, and a good operation, um, a bit more professional. So they advertise and the meetings are not just rants in a pub, but they're actual proper um, sessions set up with a focus. It could be Versailles, it could be Pride, it could be Profits, it could be anything. But people know and if they're interested in that, then they'll go down and they'll listen. 
The swastika is adopted along with the famous Nazi salute. Um, so we've got we've got some um, imagery that is attached to our party. All parties have logos and things like that. The things that appeal or draws immediately to to a brand. So it's a bit of early marketing, really, uh, and it was it was super effective. Um, he also buys a newspaper in December of 1920, uh, the People's Observer. Obviously, um, we haven't got televisions and Sky and the internet and everything then. So one of the best ways, probably the most effective way to get your message across, was to have a newspaper. And it would be the NSDAP newspaper. So people will know that they will buy that paper because it supports their views. So a little bit like in our country, we have lots of different newspapers. Some of them are right wing, some of them are left wing. Some of them in the middle, a bit more moderate. But people read particular newspapers depending on their political views. So being able to go and buy a Nazi newspaper would be really useful to get the Nazi messages and views across. Um, so it, they did. This idea of propaganda started very, very early. Uh, furthermore, the membership has increased and the more people that join the party, they bring money with them because you've got to pay to join a party. Uh, this gives the party a bit more money, a bit more clout. They're able to obviously buy things like newspapers and maybe some radio space and things like that. So they're now reaching every part of Munich, um, Bavaria and other parts of Germany. Remember Bavaria is down south and Munich is in Bavaria. Um, but the Nazi party are starting to get themselves out and about um, well known and listened to. And obviously, as we know, he takes over in 1921 uh, and it becomes Hitler's party. All right. He chooses his key allies. And we'll look at these key allies as we uh, go through the final session of the uh, part of this session. All right. So these are some of the key people of this new party of Hitler's party. He's put people in uh, where he believes they'll be good at the top. So Rudolf Hess, he's rich. He becomes the number two. OK, so Rudolf Hess, he's very famous. He plays a massive role as the Nazi party developed and during the war. Hermann Goering, he's young, he's rich as well. So obviously he brings some some money, some well needed funds to help promote the party. He's an absolute hero, actually. Um, he was a pilot in World War One. So he's got support and respect from from many people. Uh, so it's Hermann Goering there. You'll recognize Goering. He's almost everywhere the Nazis go, particularly in the films or the Rise of Evil. You'll see this shiny black coat will represent and reflect where Goering is. Okay, uh, Julius Streicher, he uh, is a publisher uh, and he works with the newspaper Der Sturmer. We'll look at Der Sturmer a little bit more as uh, the course goes on. But he is effectively uh, a publisher who helps get the Nazi messages out there. All right, so he's very important, isn't he, to the Nazi party because if people don't hear what you think or what you're saying, then you'd be as well not existing. And then Ernst Rom. Okay, so we've talked about, he was at the start of the DAP. He was Anton Drexler's number two. He is uh, the leader of the SA. So he's he's quite a tough guy. He's, he's hard. He's scarred. Uh, he's an army soldier. He's very popular. Uh, and actually, he's super popular with the, with the SA and, and ex-soldiers, which is part of the reason probably why he was killed uh, a little bit later on by Hitler, because he was too powerful. All right, so that's Ernst Rom. Um, Ludendorff, the general, remember he fled, didn't he, at the end of World War One? but Hitler has also made friends with Ludendorff. He is adored and idolised by the German people, particularly the, the right wing, the nationalists. They see him as a hero um, and he was screwed like everybody else um, by the politicians uh, at the end of World War One. So when you get General Ludendorff sort of supporting or advocating your party, he carries some sway with him. So him having him on board... Uh, is certainly going to get a few eyebrows raised um, from the political classes um, and as well maybe get some extra support from people who are a bit like, I'm not really sure, they are a bit nuts, I don't really like what they're saying, all of it. But when Ludendorff supports them, or well, if he supports them, then then they must be okay. That kind of thing. So that's why having Ludendorff was important. And then this guy, um, hopefully we've heard of this guy, um, Joseph Goebbels, probably, arguably, it's one of those things, isn't it, history or interpretations. Without Goebbels, the Nazi party and Hitler was nothing. So Goebbels was in charge of propaganda. He becomes a propaganda minister. Everything that was seen in the 1930s in Germany, uh, around the world, and, and late 1920s as the party really developed, it was all passed through the office or the desk of Joseph Goebbels. Everything that we see, everything that was published, was not an accident. Every poster, every radio broadcast, every rally... 
everything was deliberate and it was propaganda by Joseph Goebbels. So he joins the party in 1924. Um, he, he basically is working in Berlin. He takes over in Berlin. He's quite powerful up there. Uh, but interestingly, he wasn't liked by everyone in the Nazi party. And I, and I don't think he was particularly liked by Hitler either uh, until 1928, where he delivers a speech um, regarding Kristallnacht when the Jews were attacked um, on this one night. Uh, and he sort of stood up and Hitler thought, yeah, OK, we'll, we'll go with you. Um, so that's Joseph Goebbels, a very brief overview of him. He is in charge of brainwashing. OK, Goering, we've talked a little bit about him. He's disillusioned with this Weimar Republic. Again, like most people who were soldiers and who fought, they didn't believe they lost. He was angry. So he's been put in there because he clearly feels strongly uh, about or very anti the Weimar Republic. So he's probably a good person to have. And, and like we've said, is very popular with the people. Hess uh, served in the war as well. He was at the Battle of Ypres with Hitler uh, and he joins the Air Force. Um, so we can see that the, Hitler has recruited soldiers, um, people who fought for Germany, people who clearly fight for Germany. All right. When Hitler gets arrested after the Munich Putsch, so the next session we'll look at, um, Hess is there with him. All right. He's his private secretary and it's Hess who effectively dictates or writes Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, um, with Hitler in prison. So he plays quite an important part. He is incredibly devoted to Hitler. Um, incredibly. Some say uh, a little bit too devoted to Hitler. You can read into that wherever you want. Okay, and here's our Rom again. So the leader of the SA, the Brown Shirts, joins the German Workers' Party very quickly after the war. Uh, you can see in the Rise of Evil film, um, if you've watched it or if you, as you're watching it as we go through, uh, he's a big man and he was a big man. All right, so after his part in the beer hall putsch, he takes command of the SA. Uh, the SA grows to have millions and millions of members. And this is why that's important for Hitler because uh, effectively Rom has control of an army. Remember that the army in Germany is only 100,000 soldiers now. The SA eventually grows to 4.5 million. Now Rom controls those 4.5 million. So he is, he is killed. Now he is a left-wing socialist and he's also openly gay. He's, he's a homosexual. So lots of people argue perhaps that was the reason why Hitler kills him. Um, in the Night of the Long Knives in 1934. Um, but more likely, probably, it was due to the fact that he was just too powerful um, and he controlled the SA and Hitler didn't like that. But we can make our own mind up on that as we do the, that topic a little bit later on. Himmler, okay, so this is the first time we've come across Himmler. You may have heard of Himmler already. Uh, he is as, as important as Goebbels. So Goebbels is about brainwashing. Himmler was about the fear or the terror. He controls the terror in Nazi Germany. So he joins very early, 1923. He's a bit, bit nerdy, a bit, a bit of a geek, really. Um, really didn't like um, death or fighting or any of that. He felt like he was a bit useless during the war. So perhaps this was his way as he grew in the Nazi party, particularly began running the camps, uh, the death camps, that he could contribute to Germany like he didn't or couldn't um, back in World War I. Um, lots of stories where he was sick when he got people's blood splattered on them when they were shot and things like that. So again, another irony that the man in charge of terror and all that evil murder actually couldn't stand it, uh, couldn't stand blood um, and, and things like that. But it, this is who he is, Heinrich Himmler. He is the leader of the SS and the death camps. Okay, So he's in charge of all of terror as we get into Nazi Germany, uh, the Gestapo and, and all of that. So we've got our key people now. Let's just have a little recap before we move on. We've got Goebbels, the propaganda minister. We've got Himmler, the leader of the SS and the terror. Um, and we've got Ernst Rom, uh, who is in charge of the SA. So the thugs of the Nazi party, um, bodyguards, wh whatever you want to call it. The SS, the black shirts, probably were more Hitler's private bodyguards. Uh, we've seen the um, smaller members of the Nazi party, but still uh, Goering has got an influence with the people, getting people like Ludendorff on side. The Nazi party is no longer a bunch of men ranting in a pub. And hopefully after this session, you can clearly see that. OK, so what are these brown shirts? Now, if you want, you can draw on your paper, on your book or PowerPoint, or whatever you're doing your notes on, you could draw a little brown shirt and annotate around the shirt uh, of what the SA or the stormtroopers they did. And we can see a couple of sources here. 
Source D being a photograph, so the nature, remember, is a photograph of the essay on parade. Now, we can see order, we can see structure, we can see regime. Probably reminds you a little bit about what an army looks like. Now, this is what the country are crying out for, isn't it? This order and structure um, compared to the chaos that we've seen in, in, in early Weimar years. So this appeals to people, the uniform, gives people a sense of pride again um, and a, a sense of control. Uh, the photograph below that, we can see Hitler in the, in, in the front, above everybody, again, the salute. But it certainly looks from this photograph that there are thousands of, of people in this photograph. Now, who knows? Propaganda might say that just if you went to the right or the left of that photograph, there may not be many people there. But what we see and what is presented to us by Goebbels is a strong and united party. And, and everyone who supports this Nazi party uh, are part of something big now. It's come a long way from the pubs in 1919. So who are the SA or the Stormtroopers? Uh, they're formed in August of 1921. So very quickly, Hitler sets the SA up. They are a paramilitary force, just a private army. Remember, we've said already, haven't we, that lots of these parties, especially the extreme parties, left and right, they have a paramilitary force. They have their own private armies, which is always going to be dangerous for governments to try and deal with. Okay, um, They are recruited from the unemployed. Now, this is interesting because as 1923 goes on, there are many people unemployed. As well as the fact that there are only 100,000 soldiers, uh, remember, after the Treaty of Versailles, so all of those soldiers, remember they're called the Freikorps, um, they would join the SA. All right? So this gave those people a role or a job, again, um, doing what they love, being military, being controlled, um, and being powerful. These ex-soldiers we've talked about, and students, so young people growing up, angry with the world that they're growing up in, feeling this was unfair, the SA and the Nazi party, it gave them something to have a bit of hope in and believe in as they grow up. Okay, so they parade the streets, they walk around the streets like we've seen in Source D, showing their power, their organisation, their force. It is would be a very impressive sight to see these hundreds of people, maybe thousands, all marching together through the streets of Germany, given, given the sense of, of pride, really. Back to the old days, remember the Kaiser and power and empire and dominance. So it appeals, it appeals to people. They control all crowds at these meetings, they let people... Um, in, they stop people going out, so people have to listen, uh, and they also attack any other political um, views, and physically attack sometimes bodies being left of communists in the street that have been killed by the SA, and I remember the judges and the law courts are right wing, so very often they would just turn a blind eye to some of these crimes and these murders, alright, so they became known as violent thugs, and they silenced opposition to Hitler. Now, this is all before the Nazi party even get elected, really. This is in the 1920s. Um, but as we'll see in the next couple of sessions, when Stresemann rebuilds Germany and fixes Germany, um, th there's no need, really, for the SA or the Nazis, in fact. And they do disappear into some relative obscurity in those Stresemann years, ready to pounce back when the moment comes and the opportunity arises. And it does in 1929. But for now, that's what the SA do. They're violent thugs who go around silencing any opposition to Hitler. All right, they, they go in, they throw smoke bombs into other party meetings, so communist meetings, uh, any of the other party meetings, they smash windows, anything to disrupt other parties. Um, and they are super loyal and obedient. And that's because they're soldiers, remember. So Hitler takes complete control uh, without the, the, the SA, possibly less effective meetings, um, there are no elections anymore. There's no discussion of policies within the party. Hitler dictates everything and the SA makes sure it happens. So to summarise, really, that, that's what the SA are. They are literally um, Hitler's physical mouthpiece. So what he says, the SA makes sure happens. And people don't mess with them because they're very, very violent and they're not afraid to kill. So they're the brown shirts. They're different from the black shirts. We'll look at the black shirts a little bit later on. They, they are involved in the terror and the death camps um, and the Gestapo and things like that. These brown shirts are just ex-soldiers, just thugs who are following Hitler's orders. Okay, And then by November 1923, there are 50,000 members. This gives Hitler the confidence to perhaps try and take over 
the country. And as we've sort of alluded to, I've said a couple of times, the next session we'll do will be the Munich Putsch where Hitler attempts to take over um, the government in Bavaria. And he believes that by November of 1923, we've been through the invasion of the Ruhr, the humiliation of that. We've had hyperinflation and the SA has 50,000 members. The people are going to support us. He believed that the people would come out onto the streets and would support the Nazis in this uprising, this rebellion. Um, and we'll see in the next session that it doesn't quite work out as Hitler had planned. Okay, this will be the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. So, just to sort of formalise this session, thinking about it as an, in exam conditions, um, let's see if we can do uh, a proper form marker. So we'll read through these interpretations together and then pause the screen and answer the two interpretations together and then work out what the main difference is. Remember, we will have about five minutes or so to do this question and they come in two sections. Interpretation two, three, and then a little sentence that summarises what the main difference is. So... Uh, we'll read through it because some of the words are quite difficult and these two interpretations particularly are, are a little bit harder than I think you might get in your exam. So interpretation two is an extract from the Weimar Republic by a man called John Haydn, published in 1996. He says, The NSDAP was built up not only on protest but on resentment. This is evident from its programme as well as the party's chief followers and leading officials. Hitler incorporated in his own person many of the major features on which his movement thrived. The deep sense of frustration, the hatred against the Jews and the Marxists or communists, the dislike of parliamentary democracy, to build up a mass movement from such beginnings and keep it together require the unique personal qualities. It was clear, for example, from the very beginning that the NSDAP depended heavily on Hitler's spectacular speaking skills. Okay, so John Haydn's um, interpretations there are very clear that the Nazi party was based on the anger and hatred and frustration within Germany and also talks a little bit about Hitler's skills as the one who brings it all together. Okay, so interpretation three is an article uh, on Hitler's style of leadership. It says, the Congress was a milestone in the organisational history of the NSDAP because it marked the beginning of Hitler's complete personalised control of the party's organisational structure, Hitler persuades the membership to give up voluntarily the rights it had enjoyed under the democratic rules of the NSDAP and to accept instead a framework of discipline and obedience to himself. In turn, he promised that his personalised control of the NSDAP would enable the party to play a more effective part in felling, bringing down the Weimar Republic. So this article suggests that Hitler has said we don't need democracy I'll take control you do everything I say and we'll have a much better chance of bringing down the Weimar Republic and because many people hated the Weimar Republic many people went along with that so now we need to think about having read both the interpretations what the view of each of them are the question will ask us um, what is the main view or what's the main difference in the views of interpretation two and three uh, about I don't know, the Nazi party or early Nazi party, something like that. So we don't need to worry too much about the amount we've just had to read. We've got to read it and we've got to understand. But remember, we have our structure. So we'll do the first one first. They can be separate initially. We'll say the view of interpretation two is. So you pause the screen, have a little think about what the view of that is. Um, and then we'll come back and have a little chat. Um, we can tell this because it says, remember, we've got a quote from the interpretation that proves what we're trying to say. And then when we do interpretation three, we do a, another paragraph, if you like. They're not really paragraphs, but a separate section of the question. Make sure we have the word whereas um, or alternatively or on the other hand, something that tells tells the examiner that the, the, this is a different view, a different interpretation. And again, we do the same thing. So the view of interpretation three is... I can tell this because it says and put your quotes in there as well. And then the difference in what we've done in this session so far with practicing these is to end this and maybe get our fourth mark for it is we have to really clearly identify and explicitly say what is the main difference between the two. And that might be because we've not made it very clear in our answer um, what the difference in views are. We've just identified so far the two different views. So this helps us just really bring it together. And the clue is that one of them is about the foundations of a party and one of them is about Hitler's leadership uh, skills or, or, or abilities. 
So that'll be the main difference. So you pause the screen and then we'll have a little uh, think about what you might have said in this, um, this task. Remember, it's four marks, five minutes probably max, maybe four if we can get in the habit of doing it a little bit quicker. Um, and we basically just say the view of interpretation two is this. I know this because it says the view of interpretation three is this. I know this because it says. So the main difference is interpretation two, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let's have a little look and then we'll see. Right, okay, so for me, the view of interpretation two is that it's talking about the roots of the party and the, the types of people who joined it and the things that made them join the Nazi party um, because they were angry with the situation and, and everything that was going on in Germany. Whereas, I think the difference in the view is interpretation three is more talking about Hitler's leadership and his idea that he'll take complete control. It doesn't really talk about... Um, the country or, or anybody else really it just talks about Hitler's style of leadership so the main difference for me is interpretation two is talking about the reasons for the growth of the Nazi party whereas interpretation three is more talking about um, Hitler's leadership strategies to take down the Weimar Republic so again probably not perfect ideas but hopefully you get the idea that there is a difference or there are differences in, in the two views so interpretations have been quite um, prominent in this session. It's quite a straightforward topic in the sense of the rise of the Nazis. We can summarise it quite simply in uh, a broad appeal to as many people as possible, um, the key figures in Hitler's Nazi party and the organisation. All right. So with that in mind, let's um, do a little memory exercise of what the Nazis stand for in the 1920s. Similar to what we did before, We'll pause it and keep trying to remember it, covering up until we get at least three or four of them into our minds that we can use as evidence in our essay questions. So what do the Nazis stand for? What have we learnt today in this session that, that tells us a little bit about what the Nazis is all about or the party is all about? So they want to destroy the Weimar Republic. All right, It says there to look carefully for 45 seconds. Let's go through it first. Then we can... Um, look at it and, and try and remember them without looking at the screen. So they want to destroy the Weimar Republic. I think by now we know that. They want to challenge uh, the terror or violence with their own terror or violence. They're an aggressive party, particularly the SA. They want to remove the Jews from all positions of leadership in Germany. Uh, they want to destroy communism. They want a strong central government. They want to nationalise important industries. That means the government takes control of them. They want to conquer, rebuild empire building again. And the word we'll use there is Lebensraum. We'll see that a lot more going forward. And they want to rearm Germany and abolish the Treaty of Versailles. So of all of those things on the screen right now, we need to try and get in our head a rough um, understanding of what the Nazi party stand for and be able to try and give off some of these examples in a paragraph or in an exam question. So look at it for 45 seconds. Try and remember them. Um, I'm going to put the screen back to just blank boxes and see if you can verbally uh, remember some of them or, or write them down on your paper or on your notes or on your book or whatever you're doing it. All right, so after 45 seconds, just pause the screen and then we'll go back uh, and see how many of these you can remember. I'm sure with practice, we'll be able to remember at least six or seven of them. Okay, so let's pause the screen, see how many you can get. And then when you're ready, just unpause and we'll go back and see how many remembered. Okay, how did you do? Hopefully you got some of those. Just keep trying this exercise. Uh, it definitely works to get things into our long-term memory. Um, I'll do it one more time just to give you a little bit of a practice. So again, I'll go back to this, pause the screen, uh, have a go and see how many you can remember. When you're ready, we'll go forward. Okay, so if you unpause. Okay, hopefully you got a little bit more. Now we'll come back to this another time, or you can certainly yourself when you think about your revision. Um, maybe turn some of these into flashcards or, or a mind map or something with some images or dual coding perhaps. You might want to draw some guns or soldiers. Um, you might want to draw communism with a cross through it. Something like that. Dual coding, remember, is putting images with text to try and help you remember them. Okay, um, that's this session complete. Um, a little bit longer than maybe some of the other ones, particularly when it's a fairly straightforward topic, but I feel it's important that we get this bit right to be able to set up the rest of the story, particularly the Munich Putsch, um, 
Hitler's big takeover, which will be the next session. Uh, as always, thank you very much. And furthermore, the resources, videos and PowerPoints are all on stchistory.com in the Germany section, especially in this case. The video section is lots of videos and the rise of evil really is a, a fantastic um, resource and a good watch. Okay, thank you and see you at the next session.